and welcome to another video by Adrian David from Pure Electric. This is part two of the video where I talk about the uh, AM2 um, endpoint assessment and all I'm doing is talking through the endpoint assessment paperwork downloaded off of the um, NET website. Okay, so I'm just talking through this for the benefit of apprentices that might be coming to sit this. I'm just explaining each section one piece at a time. So we're on section A, uh, composite installation from a three phase and neutral board. The time allowed for this is eight and a half hours for the AM2 or 10 hours for the AM2S. You'll be allowed a minimum of 15 minutes to read this section and prepare for assessment. So again, you need to read through this candidate specification that they give you because it tells you everything that you need to know. To demonstrate occupational competence, you'll be required to apply industry working practices and procedures in keeping with relevant statutory and non-statutory regulations, for example, BS 7671. You need to be able to interpret the drawings and the diagrams, schematics that they give you. Uh, prepare, install, connect and terminate conductors and cables to industry standards. Terminate and connect at a free phase and neutral distribution board and the identified equipment outlets as detailed in the candidate's handbook and diagrams. Install and bend conduit systems. That's for the AM2S. To complete this section of the assessment, you must demonstrate occupational competence in accordance with statutory and non-statutory and approved working practices. You will need to make sure that you follow all the instructions given in the candidate's handbook and drawings. Now, I'm going to read through the common errors in a minute, but it's clear to see that most people, well, I say most people, that's a bit of a blanket statement. A lot of people that follow this, um, will do this assessment, do not follow the candidate uh, pack, okay? Or what we call the specification. If you don't follow that, basically, your company could end up in trouble, uh, financial trouble where people don't want to pay for things that haven't been done properly. And that's what this is trying to teach you. OK, that when you are now a qualified electrician, you get sent off to work wherever it is your company sends you to work, that you follow the specification provided because it's a legally binding agreement between your boss or yourself, if you're the main, you know, the main contractor and the client. And if you don't follow that in a, in a court of law, um, you're, the client isn't legally obliged to pay for that work. So you have to make sure that whatever they've agreed to pay for is what they get. And if anything has to be changed, well, that uh, generates a variation order where both parties sign to say that the changes are agreed and that the cost of those changes are agreed. And in that way, it's um, dotting, the, you know, dotting the I's, crossing the T's. If it ever went to court, it would hold up. Your company would not lose money. OK, so that's what all this is about. And in my experience as an electrician, um, Obviously, you get good customers, you get bad customers, um, you get some people that use the law to their advantage. Uh, they know the law pretty well and they know how to get what they want without paying for it. However, on the other side of that, you also get people that don't know these things and genuinely grey areas appear. You know, gen they, they genuinely appear and it's up to us as contractors to make sure that we don't exploit those grey areas or don't let grey areas appear and we stick to the specification that's provided and anything out of that needs to be agreed. OK, so this is what it's all about. So common errors. <clears throat> Candidates do not install the circuits in accordance with the requirements of BS 7671. So basically you're not installing to the regs. Candidates do not install the circuits in accordance with the installation specification, which is what we're just talking about. OK, so it says here not following the specification does not mean that the work you have completed is unsafe. However, if the customer has specified that the work is carried out a certain way and you do not follow that, they would not have to pay and work could have to be taken out and replaced. And that would be a cost to your company. An example of this would be if the customer specified white conduit and you fitted black. The circuit would be electrically safe, but not what was asked for. OK. Candidates do not select the correct type of protective default. <laughs> Candidates do not select the correct type of protective device. 
This could make the circuit unsafe or trip with no faults. Now, again, all the protective devices have the installation's been designed for you. All you have to do is follow the specifications. So I don't understand why people are getting that wrong. As long as you follow specification, you'll put in the right protective um, so, uh, devices. Candidates do not select the correct size and type of circuit conductor. Again, all of this is written in the spec. It tells you what cable to use, what type of cable to use, what size of cable to use. Um, it, it tells you everything that you need to know. If the cable fitted is too small, then it will cause danger under load or fault conditions. If the circuit is not wired in the correct type of cable, then it may not have the protection against external influences required. Also as well, as if you, if you run a ring in 1.5 instead of 2.5, even if you put it on the correct size breaker to protect that, um, the client is going to say, well, that's not what was agreed and specified. So again, you know, I know it's a bit of a silly example, but you get, you get the gist. Candidates do not sufficiently tighten glands or clamps. These are checked, and if they can be undone by hand, they would be, not be deemed right or tight, shall I say. And as an assessor, first thing I do whenever I come to any board is I start feeling the stuffing glands, making sure they're tight and the compression is there. Um, SWA glands, making sure they're tight. I and mean, if you can move it in your fingers, you know, it's not tight. It's not electrically sound. Electrons aren't going to flow in a full condition, you know. So you have to make sure that all your, your um, connections are tight. Candidates do not sufficiently secure conductors in terminals. If a conductor can be pulled out of a connection between finger and thumb, it would be deemed as being loose. Now, I always say to people as well that, you know, before you screw that socket back, always do a tug test because once that socket's back, you can't remember what you've done behind it. So the all important tug test, it shouldn't come out. Um, Again, you don't want it too tight because you don't want to squash the copper down and weaken it, but it needs to be tight that you can't pull it out, okay? Or wiggle it and it comes loose. Con candidates do not correctly identify conductors and cables. So conductors need to be identified for what they are being used for. This is as per chapter 51 of BS 7671. Again, I've got a drawing up here of uh, intermediate lighting. Um, using a free core and a cable. Again, you have to specify what those conductor cores are doing, okay? Unless it's free phase, and then and then you don't. But again, you know, it's it's all written there. Candidates remove too much or too little insulation to make an effective electrical connection or increase the risk of electrical contact. If the screw term, if the terminal screw is onto the insulation then when the cable gets warm, it will soften and the connection become loose and burn, okay? Also, if you're clamped down on the insulation, electrons can't flow easily, okay? So that's gonna generate heat. If ex excessive insulation is removed, then contact could be made with live conductors. Again, you know, if you've got any st spray stray strands sticking out the back of a switch or it's sticking out too far, then that is obviously a dangerous, um, a dangerous point where someone could accidentally or inadvertently touch it or drop some uh, a cpc across it or something and and earth everything out you know so um when viewing a connection at 90 degrees you should not see any copper so effectively what that means is if if this is the mcb and the conductor's coming straight into the top you should not be able to see any um copper but if you bend it back then you'd be able to see copper and then you know that it's not caught on the insulation and when you stand it back up again, it will disappear. Now, if you're not sure, get a torch and shine it on there and have a look, okay? And then if you're still not sure, undo it, pull it out and double check it. <clears throat> circuits are not connected in a way as to ensure effective functional operation. Again, if the circuit does not work, then the customer would not pay, okay? Candidates do not ensure effective segregation of extra low voltage and low voltage cables. So the extra low voltage cables must be in a different compartment to trunking, in, of trunking to low voltage cables. So what that means is you've got to have it in a separate compartment, but also where it cuts across the low voltage side with that Cat5 cable that they're, they're asking you to install, you need to make sure that you put in um, a bridge, okay, so that conductors can't be close to each other. 
and then that way it can't pick up the magnetic field as easily. Okay, so that is pretty much it for that section. Let me just double check. That's that. So there's a few things that I've drawn up on the board here to kind of try and help you guys out a little bit, a bit of food for thought. If I just inch this up a sec, we'll start at the top. Okay. Um, move the chair out of the way. So firstly, up here, I've drawn an intermediate switch. Now with the specification that they've provided, and again, check this because they may change it at any time and I haven't seen the specification. So this is just secondhand knowledge to me. I've got to follow the specification. But what they want you to do is they want you to feed the first switch, okay? And then from that switch, they want a neutral at every single light switch. Because it says in the regulations that um, recommendation um, or consideration should be given to a neutral at every switch for future proofing. So if we go to smart switches and they need a neutral, um, it's not a fact matter of chasing the wall out, having to put new cabling in. The cable's already there, okay? So you'll have a two core and earth coming to your first light. I've omitted the CPCs for clarity. So two core and earth to the first switch. Um, from that switch, you'll then have a three core and earth to the intermediate the line will be, also L1 will be brown, L2 will be black, but make sure you put the brown sleeving on. And then the grey, and I don't have a grey pen, so I've had to use blue, the grey will be the neutral, and that will be into Wagos at every switch. If it specifies Wagos, if it specifies connector blocks, obviously use connector blocks. So then in your free core that's going between the switches, you've got two strappers and a neutral. Okay, and that's your three cores. When that comes to the intermediate switch, L1 to L1, L2 to L2, okay, set standard. And then the neutral will just join in the back of the switch. And then again, L2 to L2 of the next switch, L1 to L1. And then from the last switch, you'll be able to take a two core and neutral, uh, two core live and neutral to the lamp, okay, to the light. Um, I don't know what lamp it is, but you know, it doesn't matter. And obviously, again, the CPCs have been omitted for clarity. The line, the switch line for the light will come out of the common, and the neutral will obviously come out of the connector block with the neutral. In. And that's as difficult as it gets. Now, this situation only works when the light is past the last switch, because otherwise, you know, depending on how long that thinking corridor here, depending on how long that corridor is, if you come out that last switch, you've then got to come all the way back to where your light is. And if that's a 30 metre corridor, let's say, that's 30 metres of cable that you're putting in, which you don't really need. Um, but, you know, for the specification, this is what they want. OK, it also talks about um, conduit, OK, installing conduit. Now, if you are making a 90 degree bend, OK, so I've drawn it here. What you would do is you would measure from wherever your box is. So let's imagine that there's a box here that you're going into. You would measure from the front of that face of that box to the wall. OK. And if that was a length of 200 millimetres, and again, you might have to take off the spacing for the... Um, uh, conduit saddles so you might have to take off the spacing for the conduit saddles okay so if it was 200 millimeters to the actual wall you might need to take five millimeters off for the saddle or whatever the thickness of the saddle is just to get that right okay don't forget to do that um, and it's also my understanding you can't move the saddles the saddles that are there they stay there so don't move the saddles once you've measured your 200 because we're measuring to the back of the bend we don't put the, um, the line on the center of the bender because that's where the bend starts, okay? So you get a lot of people that don't know where that bend actually starts on their benders and you'll see little cuts and nicks and black marks where people have tried to work it out or take a guess. All you really need to do is it's the center of the actual bender itself, okay? The former, it's the center of the former. So wherever that pin is on the side, Center of that vertically, okay, is where the bend will start, okay. 
because we're doing it to the back of the bend, we don't want to put our mark here because that's it will then start bending at 200. We want it to finish bending at 200. So what you need to do is you need to move your mark past the 200 and then with an engineer's square, so a set square, okay, you would then mark, you would put this between here and here, so the edge of the bender to the conduit and you would line the mark up on your conduit with this set square going vertically, okay? That will then be the back of the bend because as this bends round and drops round, the conduit will end up here, okay? And that will be the back of the bend, all right? So it's as simple as that. If you had to then do a kick out for that, which I've sort of drawn over here, always do the 90 bend first, okay? Because then you can hold up that up in place and then you can work out where your kick out is gonna be, all right? So for this example, and I've just drawn it over here, I've, I've got a metal knockout box, which is 50 millimeters to the back of the, to the knockout, all right? Not to the back of the box, but to the back of the knockout. So if I was looking at the hole, uh, I'd be measuring to the back of the hole, okay? And again, here, for instance, you know, if there was a, a saddle, so here's a saddle, I would be measuring off of the saddle or taking the thickness of the saddle out if it was about five millimetres or so. So I would have my 90 coming down here. If I had to bend that um, double set out within a certain distance, okay, let's say I had to allow 225 millimetres, all right, that's from the edge of the box to where the double set needs to kick out. I could then have my bend here, mark the first line at the 225 millimetres on my conduit. And then the second line, you need to work out how far that's going to be. Basically, you measure from the wall to the hole that you're trying to get to. Okay, to the back of it, in which in this case it's 50 millimetres. Okay, I've just done 50 because it's a nice round number. Then what you do is you double it. Okay, so 50 millimetres times two is 100 millimetres. So I've got 100 millimetres between my two lines. Make sense? And then what I'm going to suggest here is a 30 60 bend. Because obviously 30 and 60 equal 90. And there's our, our triangle there. Okay, so once you've put that in your bender, and you always need to make sure that you would bend this on the same line, okay? So you don't bend it this way and then turn it round and bend it the other way because then you'll end up either too close together or too far apart, depending on which way you've stuck it in the bender. So you need to make sure you bend the same way every time. Here I would bend... I'd put my first mark in at 100 on that vertical line from the centre of the bender and I would do my 30 degree bend here, okay? So 30 degrees, you know, would be about here. And you can kind of then take that out. You can kind of take that out and um, mark that against a wall or a straight edge. And if you've got a set square, that says 90 or and 45, obviously you can sort of hold it up against that and gauge where that 30 degrees is. Now in the real world, I know climb tools now have this magnetic level that you can stick onto your conduit, your metal conduit, which then tells you the bending angle. I'm pretty sure you won't have that in the AM2 or the AM2S, but in the real world, that's what you could do. You could also on your phones, and I can't use my phone because I'm recording on it, but in your phone, smartphone you've probably got a level i know i have on my iphone which tells me where level is and it tells me the degrees of angle as i bend it down so you could stick your phone on the conduit and then bend that down and it will help you find that degree of bend we're going to have to gauge it so you kind of aim for 30 degrees don't have to be an exact science as long as whatever you build out this end you then stand you know sort of lay it down again so I'll do the first bend at 30 degrees. What I would then do is I would spin that over. 
okay? And then, so my kick out would be coming here, and I would probably get that conduit and put it in position to make sure that I've got enough of an angle coming out before I bend it back in again. Because, let's say, that, oh, I don't really want to draw this in, but maybe if I use this to sort of represent, if my bend was too shallow and it was like that, okay, so from here to here, well, there's no way I can stand that back out again, all right? And if it's here to here, then obviously I've bent it too much and I've got to do a lot more bending to pull it in. So what I would do, follow that line, I can see that it comes past, um, you know, if I was I can hold it this way, it might make it easier to see. I can see that this comes past the box and I know that I've bent it enough that I can now stand it down level, okay? And again, you can, you can sort of put it against a straight edge, like the edge of a table, and measure that, okay? I've seen that in the GSH video. You can measure it and sort of gauge it a bit, um, and then and sort of bring that back in again. Once you've done that double set, then cut the pipe down, okay? So cut the conduit down, but don't forget to allow for... Um, let's choose a colour here. We've got a few brown. Don't forget to allow for a coupler. Okay, so your coupler is going to go here. So that's your coupler. And you want to be halfway through that coupler. That's where you're going to start threading. Okay, if that makes sense. Because on this side, you're going to have a bush. So your bush is going to be here, and that's going to thread in this way. You do not want the two to meet, okay? You want them to meet as close as they can, but obviously if, you, if you've done that too long, the bush won't screw in tight. This conduit won't be tight, it'll be all loose, and you'll get marked down on it. Now one of the things that I want to make clear to you guys as well is that in order to, and this is just my understanding, in order for net to have consistent marking okay they record how they strip it down and, and the, what you've done so even though you've installed it beautifully on the outside okay when they strip it down they're still marking they're still assessing you they're still recording data so you need to make sure you file your conduit no burrs okay that there's no sharp edges that are going to damage cable if you do damage cable it might be easier just to rewire it rather than trying to repair it and if you do repair it, electrical tape is not sufficient for repairing a cable. Okay, it should be heat shrink sleeving. So just bear that in mind. When they strip it, if you've done something wrong, don't try and hide it. Okay, because they're going to strip it down. They're going to continue to mark it as they go. And if there's anything that they find when they're stripping it down, they'll mark you down. <coughs> okay. Then what I've done a bit further down here is... If you were bending into um, plastic, for instance, so down here, if you were bending into plastic to get a bubble set, I don't know if you can see that over the other side, you're getting a bubble set. What you do first is you bend the start of the bubble set. So basically you want a V. And then you would measure from the wall how far it's got to come out. So if you look here, I've got a pipe and then you need a set distance between that pipe and the conduit. Uh, and in the City and Guilds book, Pete Tanner's City and Guilds book, it says that um, it should be the width of the conduit. Okay, so if you've got 20 mil conduit, you should have a 20 mil gap. If you've got 25 mil conduit, it should be a 25 mil gap. If you've got 30 mil conduit, 30 mil gap, and on it goes. Okay. So coming back here, you would bend your V. Now you want that quite, depending on where the saddles are, because again, if the saddles are here and here, okay, so if these are saddles, here and here, if that's too far open, you're never going to be able to sit it into the saddles. So you need to make sure that when you bend it, you've got enough position here for the conduit to sit in the saddles. Okay, so you need to get it. You don't want it too tight. You want a bit of a, 
a relaxed sort of bend here. You don't want a 90 because obviously you've got to pull your cables through there. So you're going to have to sort of gauge how you're going to do this. It's easier for me to do it, and I well, we'll do a video on this. It's easier for me to show how to do it than it is to actually draw it, okay? So just bear this in mind for now. Once you've bent this V and you're happy with the shape of the V and you've got enough space for the saddles, what I want you to then do is get a metre long level or the straight edge of a table, okay? And you want to measure 50 millimetres which in this case I've measured 20 and this, this is 30, that pipe is 30 on a, uh, so it's a 15 mil pipe and a 15 mil clip. So I've got 30 mil there plus the 20 space, it's giving me 50. You're going to measure 50 millimetres from the back of the conduit to the level. Okay, so if your level was this way, okay, this is your level. And that's your straight edge. You're going to measure that there. That you'll then mark it here and here on this side of the level, okay, where your 50 mil is, and that's where you're going to bend it back out again. So what you end up is with this over here, okay. So there's your bend. You've bent it back out. Here are the two saddles. So it's saddle one, saddle two. Saddles. And if I was then bending that up to meet something, okay, and it's always easier to bend the bubble set first because then you can centre it over the pipe. I would then draw a line down from whatever it is I was trying to marry up with. I'll draw a centre line down and that would be the centre of my bend, okay. And then what I, so fix it into place on the con, on the conduit saddles, fix it into place. I would then mark that so it's not all moving around. Get this marked to the centre. What I want you to then do is measure 50 millimetres either side. And the reason for that is the bending radius for a 20 millimetre pipe, 20 millimetre conduit pipe, is a 100 millimetre radius. And it's pretty much the same radius as what's in the metal bender. Okay? So you want a 100 mil radius, which I've kind of use this to gauge. That's probably a bit less than 100 mil, maybe 90 mil, but you get you get the picture. That's the bending radius. If it's too tight and it's like a builder's elbow, the cable won't go around the corner very well and you'll burn the cables and it'll be really hard to pull. So you want a nice sweeping bend. And the way to get the sweeping bend is to measure 50 millimeters either side of your center line, okay? What that then means is, if you look over here, what I want you to do is bend it. So you warm up your pipe, you bend it on the center line. You then bend it on that 50 millimeter line either side. So you get a bit of a relaxed bend. So you, this is your pipe. You bend it once, you bend it twice, you bend it three times, and you kind of end up with this shape. And then what you do is you use your, your knee to, oh, you lost my balance. You use your knee to bend, blend them into each other. OK, so you warm it up and you blend them into each other and it becomes a nice sweeping bend. And, you know, other than that, guys, the only other thing that I can think of is if you just look down here. So here I've just sort of done a quick sketch. I don't know if you can see this. I might just bring it in a bit. OK, quick sketch of stripping cable. And I know it's simple, but... If you bend it over and it's like that, it's too little, chances are your screw's gonna still terminate onto the single core. If you strip it too much, this is what they're talking about with strands hanging out the back or too much insulation maybe sticking out as well, as well as you know having that much of a gap between a terminal. So you want it just right. You want this to be equal and that should not come past the installation, okay? Right. Well, I hope that's been of some use to you guys. Um, coming up next, video three, which will be on the testing side. So the next video will be on inspection, testing and certification of the composite installation. And again, just to remind you all, this is all online. OK, it's on the net website. 
as a download and it is the pre-assessment manual for the AM2 and the AM2S. Right, take care guys, see you soon.